Welcome to the A Minute to Midnight show folks and my name's Tony and today on the show I have the return of Marsha Montenegro. Now we have had Marsha on the show once before and that was I think October 2017 and if you want to go back I think it's episode 147 where you can hear much of Marsha's testimony but it's nice to be talking to you today and uh, perhaps you could give the listeners just a brief recap into who you are because not everyone obviously will have heard the first interview. Sure, thank you Tony um, and thank you for having me on. Uh, My background is that I spent about 20 years or more in what is called the New Age. I was very involved with Eastern religions and I had an interest in the paranormal. So I was interested in powers of the mind, um, like psychic powers, a very strong interest in astrology. And I got involved with um, meditation, guided meditation, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, <laughs> um, and a lot of different things. I ended up concentrating on astrology and actually became a professional licensed astrologer and I had clients of course and then I ended up teaching astrology as well and becoming involved in the astrological society so I became the president of that organization and I also was involved with the um board of astrology examiners in the city where I lived and what we did was we formulated an exam each year um, for people who wanted to be licensed by the city and we graded the exam and uh, I was chairperson of that group for the last three of the four years I was on the board so I was incredibly involved And I had a very strong New Age views of God um, as an energy, Jesus as a spiritual master who was enlightened, a man who was enlightened. And I was very much into Buddhist kind of thinking as well. So I had sort of a, a real mixture of things, which is what the New Age is. It usually is a mixture of various um, beliefs and so you can go into a lot of different directions so not everybody is the same and all the things I was into would not necessarily be reflected in other people in the new age so it's kind of good to know that you you get people with different things that they've been attracted to and then they follow those areas Um, and you know then the Lord intervene in my life and uh, it's it's a long story but it's on my website um, which is Christian answers for the new age.org if anyone wants to read it and and I trusted Christ the very very end of 1990 and a few years later started being invited to speak about the new age to share my story And that eventually led to a full-time ministry. So now I have a ministry, Christian Answers for the New Age. And I have churches that support me. I work um, under a mission board. And I'm very um, active because the New Age is a very, very large area. And it has become very mainstream in the West, uh, Europe. Um, United States and then I know in Australia and I'm pretty sure in New Zealand it's pretty big as well yeah. so it's um, it, it's very good at, at mainstreaming uh, through the use of language and concepts that seem very helpful and beneficial it always appears beneficial always and people don't know Uh, usually what they're dealing with, and so they accept it. Um, So anyway, it it keeps me busy. (laughs) Yeah, it's no wonder it's become so mainstream in a way because 
Uh, it's there right there in the United Nations with the Lucius Trust, you know, right in the centre of the United Nations and all oh, Alice, yeah. yeah, Alice Bailey's teachings, and they pushed that, uh, and it's very much woven into the framework. So it's obviously creeping out further and further because it's it's got the backing of the UN, and, um, you know, so it's no wonder. But it it's creeping into churches more and more, I think, and so many things of the practices have you noticed an increase in sort of new age practices and also basically Gnosticism in Christianity? Yes, definitely. Um, and I have been noticing this trend for the past several years, and we can see it in, in various ways. Um, one of the areas that I have been focused on recently, well, there's a couple of areas, but one of them uh, is the Enneagram. And I actually was more or less taken by surprise by how rapidly this has penetrated um, the evangelical church. Uh, I, I'm not always surprised to see New Age things in the church, but <laughs> I was a little taken aback by how quickly this um, got in. And, and it seems to be coming more and more popular. I'm getting a lot more questions about it on Facebook, um, messages from people who ask me, you know, the, what what's with this Enneagram business, you know, are, are some people in our church are doing it or telling me to do it, or our pastor thinks it's a good, you know, tool. So I had already uh, written an article on the Enneagram a number of years ago, and I was aware of it. When I was in the New Age, I was aware of Gorgiev, who uh, it, it supposedly originates from Gorgiev's teachings. And Gorgiev was, I guess you could kind of call him an early New Ager or a pre-New Age, New Ager, because <laughs> um, he was back in, he died in 1949. Yeah, so he was the, basically a, a mystic from the 1800s, and he was quite yes. old when he died, I think, wasn't he? Yeah, I think he was. Yeah, yeah. he's a, he, yeah, a mystic um, who, who also took from a lot of different uh, ideas, you know, and kind of meshed them together. And he claimed to have been on this journey where he learned from all these wise men. Um, it was never verified that he really did this journey, but there was a book um, he wrote on it called Meetings with Remarkable Men that was actually made into a movie which I saw when I was in the New Age. I saw this movie um, at a little art house theater uh, where I was living. And <clears throat> Gurdjieff passed on his ideas. Uspensky was his biggest uh, follower. And Uspensky kind of took Gurdjieff's ideas and formulated them and wrote about them and, and solidified them. And the Enneagram came that way. Uspensky took some ideas from Gurdjieff related to these numbers, and no one really knows for sure where the Enneagram is from. Uh, some people think it comes from Sufism, uh, which is the mystical, mystical spinoff of Islam. I think Islam, um, well, no, I think they, they accept it, but it's a, it's a mystical side of Islam. And some people think it comes from that. Other people think, think it's uh, from sacred geometry. It definitely involves sacred, sacred geometry because the number nine is considered a divine number in a certain system um, that, the that the formulators of the Enneagram uh, followed. So maybe, maybe because a lot of people probably won't have heard of the Enneagram, and some won't even know what sacred ge geometry is. Maybe you should just right. give a quick update yes. uh, to people on what they actually are. Yes, I should. Thank you. <laughs> <'Cause sometimes laughs> That's I, I right. Start going off, and and you you, you know I'm I'm just way out there. So <laughs> yes, I should <laughs> I should say that the Enneagram is a chart. And if you look at it, um, and if you Google it, you'll find lots of, you know, examples of it. It's a circle, but in the circle there's nine numbers, and uh, one through nine, and then there are lines going 
uh, back and forth in the circle from one number to another. And this is supposed to show how each number relates to other numbers in this particular chart. Uh, the way the Enneagram is being used now and the way it's being adopted in churches is as a tool of personality assessment. So it's supposed to be a way to understand yourself and your weaknesses and your strengths. And it's being added to all the time. People take this and they, you know, add their own ideas to it. So you can even find um, Enneagrams being used in different ways. But basically, originally, the Enneagram as developed by Uspensky and other people who came after him was a tool for awakening the true self. Now, the true self is supposedly your sacred self, the, the self that is the real you. There's the outer you and the part of you that's not awakened uh, spiritually, and this is called the ego. Uh, the real you, the true self, is this awakened self. And so the Enneagram represents a way to come to a spiritual awakening of your true self. That's how Uspensky taught it. And um, it was still being taught that way um, later on. Now, let me say something about sacred geometry real quickly. Sacred geometry is an occult practice, and it's a view that certain angles, uh, certain relationships that are geometric have inner inner spiritual meanings. So people into sacred geometry will, they can study, it, it, it's actually used also in feng shui, um, which is Chinese, but the idea of the relationship of things to things around it, according to the angles and measurements, um, that that has an inner meaning, that is sacred geometry. And then you can use sacred geometry on a piece of paper, you know, drawing angles and having the relationship of different numbers. It gets very, very complicated um, because you can draw triangles on triangles and then have another triangle. And, you know, you're showing all these layers supposedly of spiritual meaning behind these relationships. So it, get, it gets very complicated, but it is an aspect of the new age and it is actually an occult, part of an occult worldview. So sacred geometry played into the Enneagram as well because um, the repetition of numbers of three, because of course in, in the number nine you have three times three, and this supposedly means something in sacred geometry. And all the lines that are drawn in the Enneagram with the numbers relating to each other will show these what they call triads these groups of three. And this all had meaning to Uspensky, um, who was a, the pupil of Gurdjieff. And then Uspensky um, passed this on uh, to a man named Oscar Ichazo. Now, Ichazo is very important because uh, in the development of the Enneagram, he really um, studied it and had a lot of teachings on it. Ichazo was involved in psychedelic drugs and shamanism and actually had a spirit guide. Um, it was an angel. Well, he said it was an angel named Metatron. Metatron, in, interestingly enough, is a name of an angel in the Kabbalah, which is another Gnostic system. Um, and so whether Ichazo studied the Kabbalah or not, I don't know, but he very well could have. And that may be why he thinks he was in contact with this angel. Um, and I'm sure he was in contact with an angel, but it was a fallen angel. Yeah. <laughs> and um, he claimed he formed a group, an esoteric occult group. And he claimed this group was guided by an interior master. Well, that means a spirit guide. They had a, they had a spirit guide. Now, Ichazo taught a psychiatrist named Naranjo, who was from Chile. 
And Naranjo took these teachings from Ichazo on the Enneagram and passed them on to a Jesuit named Bob Ox, O-C-H-S, who, who then brought it into Roman Catholic circles at the Esalen Institute in Big Sur, California. The Esalen Institute is very famous um, for being a sort of hotbed of early New Age ideas that were mixed in with psychology and psychotherapy. And Naranjo, who had studied with Ichazo, taught there. And so the teachings were there, and then they got to this Jesuit, Bob Ox, and then from there it, it went into the Catholic Church. And actually, at many, many Roman Catholic retreats um, in the 90s and possibly much earlier, that part, I, I don't know the history of that too well, but they were teaching the Enneagram at these retreats. And that seemed to be where it was. It seemed to have not gone beyond that um, until uh, several years ago, a man named Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan priest, um, he has a center in New Mexico called the Center for Apple, um, Action Contemplation, Action and Contemplation, sorry, yeah, it's C-A-C. Um, and he wrote a book on the Enneagram. And this book became a big hit um, among um, Catholics, uh, non-Catholic Christians, New Agers, all kinds of people. It became quite a hit. And some Christians who are in a movement that is called the emergent movement and actually now is called progressive Christianity were fans of Richard Rohr. And apparently they got intrigued um, about the Enneagram from him and started teaching it. Like there were some conferences uh, several years ago. There's a big conference called the Catalyst Conference here in the United States. And they presented the Enneagram at that conference. And then I noticed that it was showing up at a few more conferences. And this was more along the lines of the progressive Christians um, and at that point, I wasn't really thinking it would go too much further than that, but it did. And just in the last year, it has been hitting evangelical churches or maybe the last two years because um, some evangelical writers and publishers publish books on the Enneagram. Um, Zondervan, which used to be a Christian publishing house and I believe was um, brought out by a secular publisher. I think it's Random House, but I could be wrong. Uh, published a book on the Enneagram um, and by a man named Christopher Huritz. And Christopher Huritz actually went on a tour around the United States to various seminaries and churches teaching the Enneagram. And he also he wrote this book too. And then another book on the Enneagram was published by InterVarsity Press, which has been in the past thought of as a very conservative um, publisher, but they published this book on the Enneagram by um, Ian Cron and Suzanne Stabile. Now, Suzanne Stabile has been involved with the Enneagram for several years. In fact, I wrote about her. I have an article on the Enneagram on my website if you want to, people want to see more details on this. And Suzanne Stabile was into the Enneagram a number of years ago. So when she wrote this book with Ian Cron, she had already been teaching it uh, for a while. She has studied under Richard Rohr and has spoken at his conferences. So there's a, def a, a direct connection there. And the thing about Richard Rohr, and I need to say this so people understand, since his book on the Enneagram was so influential in bringing the Enneagram into the church, people need to understand Richard Rohr, who really could be a topic of another podcast. Well, how do you spell um, his name, <laughs> if, if anyone's actually wanting to look it up? Uh, uh, yes, sure. Um, R-O-H-R. -R. Okay, cool. And it, a good way to see what he believes, because he's written a number of books. But, of course, you know, it takes a lot of time to read books. A good way to see 
what he believes is to go to his blog and find his blog on the Center for Action and, and Contemplation. And he writes very openly about his views. Um, he is a panentheist, so he believes God is contained in creation and creation is in God. It's not pantheism. It's, um, it's a little different, but it's uh, not a biblical view at all because God is not part of his creation. God is very distinct from his creation. He's omnipresent, but he's distinct from creation. But Rohr is a panentheist, and he's a follower of Teilhard de Chardin, who had a view about everything in creation, including humanity, evolving towards an omega point, which was this point of perfection, and Christ is part of this process that pulls everything to this perfection. Um, and another view that Rohr has, which is very heretical, is that Jesus and the Christ are, are distinct. So Jesus, like he'll say things like, Jesus died, Christ arose. And Paul wrote about Christ, but he wasn't writing about Jesus. And um, Christ said things that Jesus would have never said. Those are all quotes from Richard Rohr. Wow. Yeah. And, Pretty and heretical, so right? It's very heretical. Yet when he talks, I've heard, I've watched a lot of his videos um, and listened to a number of podcasts. And I've done a, quite a few posts on Richard Rohr on Facebook. By the way, people can go to, if they're on Facebook, look for Christian Answers for the New Age um, that's my ministry page, and that's where I post all this all this stuff. And um, he can sound very orthodox at times. You know, he can talk for a while, and he's not saying anything heretical. But sometimes when he gets into this area, he does. And he has a book coming out called The Universal Christ. It's coming out in March, and I plan to read it. And I'm sure I'll be writing Lord willing, an article on it, um, because I think in that book that may crystallize his views on Jesus. And that's going to be um, it's going to be good evidence to have as to what his view is. But based on all these things I've heard him say and what he's written in his blog, he has a heretical view of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the man whose book on the Enneagram has helped bring it into the church because I have watched this happening. I have observed it. And of course, I've kept my eye on it because it's related to my ministry. So I have watched all these steps as the Enneagram has gradually progressed um, into the church through these different ways I've discussed here. And nobody has really raised an alarm about it uh, that I know of. Um, a few people have. I found a few articles online that where people understand this is a, a problem. But in general, you know, there's no big alarm and you don't hear it from any of the, um, you know, more well-known Christians or well-known Christian spokespersons or or anybody like that. So it's just us little people yeah. <laughs> out here. Yeah. who are trying to raise um, yeah. an alarm on this. And um, now here's another thing about the Enneagram, because a lot of people will say, well, um, so what? It doesn't matter if it had all this strange, esoteric origin. You know, if we can use it as a personality tool, which is how um, Naranjo, who I mentioned earlier, turned it kind of into a personality um, assessment. And then later other people did it, um, including I need to mention Helen Palmer because she made it very popular in the new age. And Helen Palmer, by the way, is a psychic. OK, so a psychic took up the Enneagram from all of these psychiatrists who were into these esoteric things and made it very popular um, and has written several books on the Enneagram. But she is a psychic, not a Christian. Uh, and I have watched it turn into this tool now where they say, well, 
you know, we know about those things. We know that these people um, were, you know, not Christians and had these bizarre um, views, but we're using it as a personality assessment tool to, and people are helped by understanding, you know, who they are and how they relate to others. And now they're even saying, well, you can use it as a spiritual tool so that you know your spiritual gifts. Okay, so but but really, in your opinion, is the purpose and in fact the origin of the Enneagram to initiate a kind of, I don't know, Gnostic spiritual awakening? Oh, yes, absolutely. That was what it was. That is what it was devised for. And, um, but, you know, I wanted, I also make a point about the psychological aspect because I always ask, um, on what basis are there nine personality types? Where, where does anyone get that from? Where is it written? Or how do we know there are nine personality types? Yeah. Yeah. You know, in the Zodiac, I mean, I was an astrologer. In the Zodiac, there are 12. And I could actually make a case for taking the Zodiac personality traits. I could make up a chart with the 12 Zodiac types if I wanted to. And I could make a personality tool out of the 12 Zodiac types. Because you can take any group of personality traits. Um, any number you could probably do from five to, you know, 12 or whatever, 15. And you could devise some kind of system where you divide up different kinds of personalities and then use it or, you know, say this is useful for determining your personality and how you relate to. And it would seem to work because there's something called self-confirmation bias where you find what works for you and what fits you, and you go with that. In fact, in the Enneagram, you are supposed to find your own number. You're supposed to figure out, well, am I a four? Or, you know, I, I also seem like I'm a six, so I'm not sure. And then they have different ways. Of course, there are all these books that are supposed to help you understand how to do this. Of course, I have never tried to figure out my number, by the way, <laughs> because I think it's silly. And I don't see anything compatible with scripture on this. Um, one person pointed out to me on Facebook, and I thought this was very insightful. The spiritual gifts are not related to personality types. True. You know, it's, it doesn't matter what your personality type is. God can, use, God can use you. He uses all, all personality types. Um, and we're all being shaped um, by the Holy Spirit to conform to the image of Christ. It has nothing to do, God can use our personality strengths, absolutely. And we should be aware of weaknesses. Um, you know, we have to, as a missionary, I have to assess myself. You know, you have to give reports on how you're doing um, spiritually and in relationships, etc. So you have to assess yourself. But we don't need this diagram to do it. And it's very, very arbitrary is the word that I want to say, arbitrary. Yet it's being used. And I saw an article the other day where um, at, and it was on a church website. Um, and somebody wrote a long article on how you can correlate the Enneagram numbers to biblical characters. So he had different people from the Bible like Jonah and Paul um, and other people, and he had them, and he gave numbers, like, oh, see, Jonah's a nine, and Paul's a seven, and I don't remember if that's true or not, but I'm just throwing that out as an example, and see, we can see this, and I'm like, that is just so crazy to me, um, we don't really see, their personalities are not important, that's not what counts in the Bible, yeah. <laughs> so I I just, I see this, I, one of the dangers I see from this is that it, it, it leads to a very strong self-focus and self-absorption, which makes sense given that the original goal of the Enneagram is to come to a spiritual awakening of the quote-unquote true self. Well, it's all focused on you and, of course, in, in that view, coming to this divine awareness of the divine self which of course we we don't have so it's a false thing anyway 
And to try to change it into a personality tool is just, to me, is invalid. It's arbitrary. It's not helpful. I don't see it as beneficial. And I see it as leading to self-absorption. I think that we naturally, people naturally like to hear about themselves. I mean, that's why astrology is so popular. Um, You know, people want to hear about themselves. And so they like to read, you know, oh, you know, I'm a Gemini. So what does that mean? That means this and this and this about me. And the Enneagram is a similar thing. It's like, oh, now I figured out that I'm a number seven. And so, oh, I can see how I'm a seven because of this and this and this. And I have trouble with twos. And I understand that, you know, and then you start what you start doing is exactly what you do in astrology you start filtering the external world and your experiences through that number, through the zodiac sign if it's astrology, through the number if it's the Enneagram. And, of course, I'm very familiar with that from astrology. I know how that works. And if you start using the Enneagram to assess yourself and see who you are, that's what's going to happen. You will start seeing yourself and filtering everything through the supposed personality that you are of that particular number. And I think this cannot lead to anything good. Mm, very, very good points. And there, there seems to be so many different, I guess, self-absorption things and what not in society. And I'm thinking people taking selfies with their phones all the time. Everyone's posting selfies. And it, again, it's, There's nothing really wrong with that in itself, but it becomes an obsession, I think, with a lot of people. So people are obsessed with self, and and that's, you know, how many times you hear people say, I deserve something, or I don't deserve this, or so on and so on. It's just become a very self-focused generation, Um, and, and that's the same in the church. Now, what about, what's some other practices that you see creeping in that a new age or eastern of eastern origin into churches yes the other big one um very very big now in the culture and now unfortunately becoming accepted by a lot of christians is mindfulness and there is a tremendous amount of confusion about mindfulness uh and This is what happens with New Age type things is that they're presented one way and then they can appear to be something else depending on who's looking at it or who wants to define it. And then it just becomes this this morass of confusion. Mm. But mindfulness really comes from Buddhism. It's one of the steps of the eightfold noble path. Um, and it, it's connected to what is called right thinking. And so mindfulness is a practice. It is a Buddhist practice. And it's much more than just a technique or anything. It's actually part of a Buddhist worldview. And it has a spiritual goal. Because, of course, all of the steps of the Eightfold Noble Path and anything Um, in the Buddhist uh, teachings, all have a spiritual goal. And so I was involved, as I mentioned earlier, in briefly in Tibetan Buddhism and then in Zen Buddhism for a number of years. And I did mindfulness for 12 years. Um, And I will say what it really is, and then I'm going to talk about how some people, um, what people think it is or how they define it. Uh, Mindfulness is designed to make you become aware that your thoughts are not your thoughts and your self does not really exist. That's the goal of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Mindfulness, um, because the practice of mindfulness as a meditation is to observe. You're observing your thoughts. You're supposed to watch your thoughts or feelings as they go by. And um, depending on who's, how, how, how it's being taught, people will say, well, you label it, label this thought or label this feeling, and then you just move on. You don't 
judge it and you don't react to it. You just move on. Well, this is a process which distances you from your thoughts or feelings. It puts a distance there because you're being neutral and you're looking at them in this, this uh, as something away from you. And that's the whole purpose of it because doing this over a period of time does make you feel distant from your thoughts and feelings and, and does eventually make some people think that they don't even have thoughts and feelings anymore. Some people who have done mindfulness purely as a secular thing have had psychotic breaks or have had dissociation where they don't even know who they are anymore. They've had breakdowns. Um, that is one of the negative results of mindfulness. Uh, and then ultimately, after realizing or thinking your thoughts are not really you, then you're supposed to think, and this is in a lot of Buddhist texts, they say, who is the observer? If you're observing your thoughts, who is the observer or who is the witness? Um, and supposedly that's supposed to help you realize that this witness or observer is not you at all because you're observing all this. It's, it's the, the observer with a capital O or the witness with a capital W, which in Buddhism is the Buddha self or Buddha nature. Because in Buddhism, the self, the individual self actually has no substantive reality. And Buddhism teaches that you have rebirth because you're attached to this reality and you're attached to the idea that you actually exist. And that's why you keep getting reborn. So the only way out of this, because this is suffering, Buddha taught this is suffering, everything in this world is suffering. So the only way to escape the suffering is to become detached from this reality and these false ideas that you are an individual. If you can become detached from that, then you're liberated and you don't have rebirth anymore. So they, they do it as a process of first distancing yourself from your thoughts and then distancing yourself from even thinking you have a self. So, so that's why some people who do mindfulness, it works too good on them and they have these breakdowns. And what's actually happening is that the mindfulness practice is doing what it's supposed to do. It's just that it went too fast for them and they didn't know that that's what it was supposed to do when they get in trouble. Um, now, what it's being used in psychology in a lot of different therapies and it's used as quote unquote stress reduction. You can find it in women's magazines. I started noticing it in magazines like Good Housekeeping and Women's Day. And they would have a little page on your on your health or something. And it would say, oh, you know, what you can do when you're stressed out is you can sit down um, and um, or even while you're doing something, washing the dishes, you can be mindful. And you notice how the warm, soapy water feels on your hands. And you notice how the sun is shining on the bubbles. And you notice how um, the flower smells outside the window and you just sit there and you notice these things and you become, quote unquote, mindful of them. And you're supposed to not think when you do this. You're just supposed to kind of observe these things. So your critical thinking faculties are suspended. And if you actually sit down and do the mindfulness meditation where you sit still and close your eyes and breathe slowly and then you just observe these thoughts and feelings, that's the mindfulness meditation, which I did for 12 years, you really do change. Your, your worldview changes. And you be, begin to feel like you're not connected to this reality anymore. Now, as a new ager, I thought that was a good thing. But, of course, that is not a good thing at all because the reality of this world is, is that it is a reality. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, the Buddhist worldview is so contrary to the biblical worldview. It's so contrary to it. To see mindfulness get in the churches, and I was just reading an article the other day on a book called Christian Mindfulness, 
And now you see that term Christian mindfulness more and more. And the way people are doing that is partly is they're redefining the term and they're saying, well, the Bible teaches us to be mindful. We should always be mindful of God and mindful of our relationship with Christ and mindful of what Christ wants us to do. But see, they're they're equivocating on the word. They're using mindful in a way that means thinking about, you know, we should be thinking about Jesus. We should be thinking about who he is. We should be aware of our walk with Christ. Okay, that's all true. But mindfulness, that's not what mindfulness is about. Mindfulness is this technique for distancing yourself from your thoughts. And so if you were actually going to do, quote unquote, Christian mindfulness, which is an oxymoron, then you would you would say, okay, there's Christ. And who's Christ? I'm just going to see him in my mind or think of him in my mind or think of something he said, and then I'm going to let it pass by. And here comes a Bible verse to my mind, and I'll just let it pass by. I'm not going to have any reaction to it. And I'll let that pass by. And here's something that I read about um, God's um, attribute of mercy. Well, I'll just let that pass by. And I'll just, you know, and you distant yourself from it. That would be true Christian mindfulness if you really want to use the word mindfulness in its correct meaning. And, of course, that's not the way Christians are. That's not what they're saying. But I think that when you introduce this as compatible with Christianity, first of all, I think it confuses a lot of people um, because they may have been introduced to it another way. Um, And they may think that it's this okay, if they see it as a meditation, they may think it's okay to sit down and do the mindfulness meditation. If you go online, or never never mind online, now there's over 10,000, way over 10,000 meditation apps for the phone. And there's quite a few of them, and that was a few years ago. Um. (laughs) So I don't know how many there are now. There are a lot of them are mindfulness. So people get these apps on their phone that are mindfulness or include mindfulness techniques. And if they've heard it um, expressed as a positive thing at their church or by a Christian writer or on a Christian radio program, they may see it and think, oh, well, here's mindfulness. I can do this. You know, I just heard about this on that Christian radio show. Um, And then they may start doing the actual mindfulness, the Buddhist mindfulness. So the problem is people um, mostly don't know what Buddhism really teaches, and they don't really know what mindfulness is. I do have four articles on mindfulness on my website, and I have done, Tony, I have done over 80 Facebook posts warning about mindfulness since 2011. So, um, and I think I may be up to 90 by now. (laughs) So I, it's in the schools. They have it in the schools. It's big time in the schools here. I think it's big time in the schools in the UK. I think maybe, and I know in Finland, um, because I have a friend over there who's told me that. It's really big there in the Netherlands and several other places. And in the schools, they're teaching kids these things about if you're angry, then sit and just breathe slowly and then think about your anger and don't judge yourself. And they're teaching kids to deal with emotions um, as though they're a problem that they have to deal with by sitting and doing this kind of meditation or this process to go through. Instead of dealing with, you know, okay, I'm angry because my brother, you know, took my doll and, and tore off her arm, you know. Well, (laughs) you know, then you should deal with the issue. You deal with the issue. You don't sit down and do this funny little meditation. I think it teaches children that emotions are um, problems that they have to deal with immediately. And they aren't dealing with the issue behind the emotion. So there's a lot of, you know, I see a lot of problems with teaching it to children. Plus, I think if children are learning this, at young ages, they're going to become desensitized to it. So they're going to be very, very open to other forms of Eastern meditation. Having done this, they'll be very, very 
you know, it'll be easy for them to do other forms of Eastern meditation. I also think that doing mindfulness, if you're doing it as a meditation and you're sitting and breathing slowly and do that for several minutes every day, um, I think what it does is that it lowers your uh, normal resistance to things that you normally would find strange or alien. I think it makes a lot of people open to ideas that they normally would would not accept or they would they would resist in some way. I think it just opens you up. It makes you more yielding to alien ideas. That's my own theory. I have no proof, but that is my theory based on me doing Eastern meditation for a long time and and doing this ministry for over over 20 years. Um and and addressing this issue and talking to people, you know, who have meditated, talking to people who do meditate, etc. I want to make another point that people should know. The studies that were that were used when mindfulness um, was being popularized in the schools and elsewhere, people were saying, well, all these studies have been done and it shows that it helps children focus. It helps children study. Um, it helps prisoners be calmer. It helps hospital patients be calm, um, et cetera. So they were they were referring to these studies. Well, what happened was a book came out um, called The Buddha Pill, which I read. And this book, which came out several years ago, was a book on how the studies that were used to promote mindfulness, most of them were flawed studies because many of them did not have control groups. Many of them um, did not report the negative effects on people. And many of them just had a flawed methodology in their study. And so I've actually read articles since then that have said uh, the studies promoting mindfulness are, are flawed. They're, most of them are flawed and shouldn't be referred to anymore. We shouldn't keep saying science has proved mindfulness is beneficial. And at the same time this happened, there was something called the Dark Night Project, which was a study of all the negative effects of mindfulness. And uh, people doing the Dark Night, now these are secular people, these are not Christians. And the, the two authors of the Buddha pill are not Christians either. In fact, they're in favor of meditation. But they were very scandalized by these the flawed methodology of these studies promoting mindfulness. And that's why they were exposing them, um, because they said, we're scientists. We should, you know, we should if we have a study, it should be done scientifically. And we shouldn't promote things that have not been studied scientifically. So that's where they were coming from. And so the Dark Knight Project was a similar thing where People started noticing sometimes it was a private psychologist who had uh, clients or patients who had done mindfulness and had these terrible um, reactions from the mindfulness. And they started noticing this and it ended up as this project called the Dark Knight Project. And this is several years ago and it's gone past that now because um, now I have found a lot more articles where people are questioning the validity of mindfulness and the validity of the supposed science behind it. Um, but I think even though this is a good thing that they're exposing the, the negative side of this, it's gone so far in the culture that I don't know if anyone's really paying attention mm. <laughs> to um, the negative reports, you know, and I have posted a number of articles on Facebook about these negative reports um, in the, and they're in secular magazines. Uh, one of them was even in a Buddhist magazine called Tricycle. It's a very well-known Buddhist magazine, and at least in the United States. And they had an article on how everybody was just jumping on the bandwagon of mindfulness without any real sound science behind it. So I found that really interesting. So there's a lot of there's so much cautions about this just from the secular world. That's just the secular side of it. Then, of course, as a Christian, I think I already expressed uh, my views, my concerns as a Christian on doing mindfulness. Meditation in the Bible, and here's where a lot of people are confused because of the word meditation 
in the Old Testament, um, they often hear that word and they think, well, mindfulness is meditation. The Bible tells us to meditate, etc. But meditation in the Old Testament, the meaning of the words, the Hebrew words that are translated as meditation is to ponder, to reflect on. Sometimes the word means to um, say out loud or to memorize. And so meditate in the biblical way is to, is to use your mind and think about and reflect. And mindfulness in the Eastern form of meditation is to suspend your thinking faculty. So really, I mean, it's like mind emptiness, really. It's been called mindfulness, but it's almost the exact opposite in reality. It's emptying yes, your mind. But yes, exactly. It's, 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 it's a name that doesn't really express what it is. Yeah. And that's, that's another reason so many people are confused about it. And they think, well, mindful, there's nothing wrong with being mm. mindful, you know. And they don't understand the concept behind mindfulness is not about that. Yeah. And so, so, so just, that's, you know, I have a lot of concerns. Yeah. So what can what can Christians legitimately do? I can imagine some people are going, oh, man, we can't do contemplative prayer. We can't do mindfulness. We can't do this and that, you know, and, and how do we deal with stress and so on? So right. have you got any sort of positive things that, that Christians should do instead of doing these Eastern practices? Yes, well, I think, and I'm talking here about the normal person with normal stress, not people who have really extreme, you know, problems. They may have extreme mental problems or psychological problems, and that's a different matter. You know, that's, I, I, I can't address that. But just for normal Christians having stress in their life, uh, really, uh, I know this sounds, this is going to sound like to a lot of people like, oh, you know, this is just what everybody says. But really, God's word, you know, um, <laughs> it's God's word is powerful. It's living and active. God's word is not just another book. It is God's word and it is our spiritual food. And I think that a Christian who is really reading the Bible and studying it um, and also, you know, walking with Christ by uh, worshiping and fellowshipping with other believers, praying, uh, definitely when you live your day-to-day -day life in Christ and stress has come along, your first reaction is to go to Christ. You go to God's word and you go, you go to the Lord in prayer and ask for help. Uh, you depend on him. You trust him because he doesn't allow anything to happen to us that he doesn't want to happen to us. Anything that's happening to you is because God is allowing it. So you have to, th if you think in those terms, then you realize God will help you through this. I find um, in stressful times, I find reading many of the Psalms extremely, extremely comfortable. I went through some very stressful things last year and I turned to the Psalms over and over again and just different Psalms, you know, I would just look through them and find different Psalms. I also found the words of Jesus very comforting um, in, in the Gospels and I found, I found thinking about Jesus very comforting and that's my, you know, to me, we have we have the best thing anyone could have, which is, you know, a living savior who conquered death and who has given us eternal life and eternal life that that is something that is is life. We can't even imagine how wonderful it is. And while we're on this earth and we have troubles, Jesus said, you know, don't you know, don't worry about it. Worrying, worrying can't help you. I mean, he talked about this in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, we're told to think on things that are beautiful and and things that are of the Lord in Philippians 4. Uh, we're told to cast our cares upon Jesus. And the reason all these things are there for us is because God knows that we're going to deal with stressful things in our life. We're going to have a lot of stress and worries. Um, he's very aware of that, but he's given us the answers and he's given us 
you know, his words on how to deal with these things. So, I mean, to me, there's, there's just so much in God's word. And I, when I compare that to the new age teachings I used to believe and to these techniques like mindfulness or trying to understand yourself through this Gnostic chart, the Enneagram, <laughs> you know, those things are just so empty and pitiful it's next to the word of God, you know, and next to Jesus. Uh, they're just, they're so pitiful. And I, I really want Christians to, you know, rediscover the richness of what they have in Christ and in God's Word. Awesome. Great advice. Now, can you just tell the listeners at your website again? Sure. ChristianAnswersForTheNewAge.org Brilliant. And... That's been an excellent discussion. Uh, I'm hoping that people will actually go and read the articles that you've written and also go back and listen to your original testimony, which I think is, I mentioned, maybe episode 147 from October 2017, because that's worth listening to as well. And you cover some other aspects of the New Age uh, in that as well. Um, hopefully, again, we'll have you back before too long because I know you've got lots of different areas of the new age that you teach on. Thank you so much for being on the A Minute to Midnight show again, Marsha. Thank you so much, Tony. I really enjoyed it and I appreciate it. Excellent. Folks, don't forget to like this video and share it and subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already done so and visit our website, aminutetomidnight.com Besides having our shows on there, you'll also find that there's a number of good and useful articles on various deceptions and so on that are creeping into the church and other things. So there's some good articles on our website. So I suggest that you go there uh, to the website. And also we do run A Minute to Midnight 100% by donations. And if you want to help us, you can do that by donating on our website as well. And uh, we very much appreciate the people that help us out because we couldn't do it without your help. Uh, so thank you to the people that do help us. All the music used in the shows I have written, played and recorded. And you can actually download free music on our website if you want any of the Minute to Midnight music as well. You're welcome to go there and download, download it free of charge. That's about it for this show. We will catch you again with another episode of the Minute to Midnight show in a few days' time. So God bless and have a great week and we'll catch you again soon.